guys, and welcome to the Train Right podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Josh Emder. Dr. Emder is a clinician and physician leader with a passion for innovation in primary care. He's held a board certification in family medicine since 2007 and is licensed to practice medicine for over 20, in over 25 states. He spent over a decade treating the sick in the hospital prior to becoming a chief medical officer at Steady MD, where he launched the world's first personal physician service, especially for runners, that is entirely online. While caring for hospitalized patients, he learned that health is achieved outside of the hospital. His medical approach focuses on using lifestyle to treat chronic diseases and using medication only when lifestyle modifications aren't enough. His interests include using technology to improve the doctor-patient relationship and exploring alternative payment models for healthcare outside of traditional insurance. When asked what fuels him in his life, his response is clear, it's passion. Whether it's climbing big walls in Yosemite, striving for marathon personal bests, skiing big backcountry lines in the high mountains, or just being the best human he can, it's obvious that he is driven by challenges and excellence. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode today. Dr. Josh, as I call him, he's become a close friend of mine. I met him in Boulder, Colorado through my coach, Adam St. Pierre, and he's actually my doctor through SteadyMD. In this episode, we're going to talk about SteadyMD, what exactly is that, as well as how much of a badass athlete Dr. Josh is himself. So without further ado, hope you guys enjoy. Welcome to the Train Right Podcast. Thanks for being on here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and I think in your email, you said that you're looking for interesting guests. So hopefully I don't, I don't let you down. Oh my gosh, you definitely <laughs> don't let me down. <laughs> thanks for uh, having me on. Yeah, so I already, I mean, I, I, we've already had an introduction of you, so the guests know who, who we're speaking with. But um, I met you, how did I meet you? I met you through our mutual coach, Adam St. Pierre, right? I think that's probably the first time we met. Yeah. I, yeah. I had I had heard about your accident and being in Boulder, like we have a lot of mutual friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's probably through Adam. Yeah. And, uh, this, that's a great thing about being in Boulder is just such a great community of, of passionate people who are working on goals and love to be outside. Yeah. And then... You're also no, no, like known as Dr. Josh. <laughs> That's think how Adam introduced me to you. This is Dr. Josh. And he was telling me about all of like these, these, these crazy things, how you ha- were super fast on the road. And then I think the first time I met you was actually on skis. So. Oh, that was the first time I met you. Yeah, at Eldora. Yeah. 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 Adam was saying, oh yeah, he's one of these these road runners who actually likes to do mountain things. He's really fast, but he also likes to do trail running. He's like, I'm going to convert him. It's fine. (laughs) I just like it all. I love life. And that's uh, one thing that I really like about being a doctor is being involved in other people's lives, seeing the the ups and downs, the beauty of it, the hardships. Um, And, you know, with sport, it's, it's, sport is the ultimate expression of life. I think like being able to, whether you're a skier or a climber or a runner, like you find your clan of people and you go out there and you push boundaries, you see what you can do. And uh, as a doctor, it's amazing to be able to mix those two things like sport and health. And they're just ultimately intertwined. And that's why I'm really, uh, I just, uh, I love where I am right now. Like being like, you hear this all the time, like find a way to like, to, to you know live a life of passion and have your career be your passion and I I, I feel like I'm actually doing that right now oh that's awesome because we've had so many deep conversations just like sharing either skin tracks in the mountains or like um (laughs) runs I mean but I think you're the embodiment of that like you're so psyched on big mountain goals but you're also like I've learned so much from you about what it means to care for a community and to care for another human being. And I'd like to talk to you about like, what exactly is this? How have you been able to combine your passion with your career? Yeah. So um, let me just start, like you you refer to me as Dr. Josh. I think it's really funny. Like this is a name (laughs) that I kind of acquired, I think over the past two years. So um, 
I'm the son of a physician who will always be the Dr. Emder, my, my role model. <laughs> and uh, you know, I spent 10 years working in the hospital where hospital work, um, a lot more formal than being a personal doctor online, which is what, what I'm doing now. Mm. And um, with this online practice of mine, like patients are always like, you, you, you feel, I feel like I'm, I feel, they're like, Josh, like, I feel like you're my friend, but you're also your doc, my doctor, like, what should I call you? And it's like, that's a tough question. Cause it's like, <laughs> I, I, I would prefer that patient just call me by my name, Josh, but yeah. there's something about that doctor that imbues trust mm. and um, that professional relationship that yeah. is a really important part of what I do. So that's kind of how I think Dr. Josh has, has come to be. I love it. So, um, you know, getting back to my dad as my role model, I mean, uh, my father has always been that kind of doctor. He's still, he's, he's, uh, he's mid seventies, not to, not to put it out to the world how old my dad is, but uh, <laughs> he's still in practice full time. And he's always been that kind of doctor who, Hillary, you could call him right now and be like, hey, Dr. Emder, I'm a friend of Josh's. I have this problem. And he would be there for you because yeah. being a doctor is just in his DNA. It's what he is. It's what he does. Mm -hmm. And times have changed now with the newer generation of doctors who are employed. They aren't out building their own practices. Um, they're like most primary care doctors now. Um, are employed by big companies, they have thousands of patients, and they don't really have the process in place to be able to have, you know, that kind of personal relationship, being able to answer the phone for every patient who calls them just because the model doesn't work that way. Yeah. So with what I'm doing at Steady MD is having a much smaller panel of, you know, of around 300 patients who have access to me. And um, it's really built on the model of that doctor who you have access to who knows you is aligned with your life mm -hmm. and um has time for you yeah so um that's uh what i've been doing and i think from the patient perspective it works really well and from the doctor perspective it works amazingly well because it's really in the relationship that you can really have an impact on someone's health if it's yeah. just like you're seeing your doctor, you know, once every couple of years where he does some blood work and like checks the boxes, that's probably not going to move the needle for your long-term health. But if you have that opportunity to have a continual relationship with a doctor who just kind of understands what you're going through, it's really powerful. Yeah. And I think it's like, I mean, you talked about this just like in the current age of technology where it seems like people like I've gone into several doctor's offices and mostly everything is on screen. There's like limited, there's limited kind of interaction. It all seems kind of streamlined into computers and stuff like this. Like, and I think in, in a world where like that is actually like replacing actual like physical interactions. I mean, yeah, I can kind of, I don't, I don't know, I think you've kind of struck a, like a really cool like balance because when I, when I first, like you were my doctor through SteadyMD and granted, maybe I got it a little bit too late. Um, like after my, my accident is kind of when I, you know, I always had a doctor, but not like never really saw them regularly, but it wasn't until after my accident that I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to be traveling more, especially abroad, like it makes sense to be able to have someone that I know and trust to be able to like check in with. Um, and I think actually our first meeting, even though we both lived in Boulder, it was like online, which is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that part is always funny. No, but I mean, it is a little bit awkward, but it actually, for me, it, it does. It actually feels like you, it, it is more personal. You can get to see someone, even though it is through like, you know, a non face-to-face -face, um, interaction. It is, it is better but better, better than, than nothing. And it actually eliminates for me, at least, like if I'm in the physical place of being able to meet with the doctor, no matter where I am in the world. Yeah. And like getting to the point of like alignment, um, the way medical education works, you go to medical school for four years, then you do, uh, you pick a specialty. My specialty was in family medicine. From there, I was really close to doing a fellowship in sports medicine. 
Mm. Um, where in sports medicine, it's really training to be a team doctor. And I spent a couple months doing that. And kind of the, the appeal to sports medicine is always like, oh, like you can be at the football game every week. You can, you know, be on like the sidelines, like taking care of the athletes. And for me, like that was just not appealing because I'm a, I like to participate, not watch. So <laughs> albeit I'm not boarded in sports medicine, I see what my real value is, is I understand the passion and the crazy of kind of mountain athletes. <laughs> I would definitely with, agree with that. Uh, and, and runners, because like, so many of my patients have just been told like by their doctors like um to just stop running and that's just not good advice for a lot of people i mean there's definitely times when you have to shut it down from an injury or mm -hmm. if you're actually doing damage yeah. but telling people to not run is not a treatment plan i mean that is a, a plan to that's when when you shut when you shut an athlete down you know it's really a road to tightening up more injuries depression and really not being the person that you want to be. So my, like, I, I really see that as a strength of mine as like, you know, is climbing El Cap a good idea medically? Definitely not. But like <laughs> if you're a climber, you're going to climb. So like, let's get you into like the safe place so you can, you know, accomplish your goals. And you've climbed El Cap, no? I have. Yeah. Back when I was a young kid, I mean, I was like, 20 years ago now but it's still a big it's still a big part of my life no it's a huge i mean you you i mean with your current with your wife now right you guys were like climbing all over the u.s like traveling and climbing like living out in a van no that made <laughs> a dream in the dream world uh, no, my wife and i met when she was in medical school we have had a a, a lot of great adventures yeah. um climbing definitely isn't for everyone and was never really for my wife either but she loves <laughs> to hike and ski um, yeah, I climbed El Cap with, uh, with, uh, one of my good friends, Andy Wellman, who, uh, if you're listening to this, uh, he's up in the uh, Pacific Northwest, but yeah. like, that's a great thing about outdoor adventures is like, if you share an epic adventure with someone like, and it goes well, like you, you'll be friends for life. Oh man. I, I mean, even, <laughs> didn't even have to be an epic adventure. It could just be like an epic training run at your back door. I think we've had oh, several my. of those, but I mean, so you touched on this. So for Steady MD, I mean, it really appealed to me because you are an athlete, you're a runner, you are a mountain athlete. And so you get it. You kind of, we kind of speak the same language. So yeah. would you say that's the majority of your, of your clients? Like they are athletes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, really my practice is, is, uh, is, comprise of people who really value their health mm. and we have had uh, I do have a lot of athletes but I'm really I'm just looking to care for people who want to be healthy and be the healthiest versions of themselves and uh, athletes um, I, I love taking care of athletes and it's so important because when you're pushing things are going to happen injuries illness um, just because you run and you, and you live an active life, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't make you immune to like chronic diseases. You can't really outrun your genetics a lot of times. Yeah. So, um, really the value is having someone who, a good analogy is like a financial advisor. Like I, I like to think of myself as like a financial advisor for someone's health. So. We're in an interesting age where really anyone can access all the studies, all the medical information that has ever been created by mankind. And this is a new thing over the past probably decade. Like yeah. before the advent of the internet, medical knowledge was kept under lock and key in medical libraries. It was yeah. passed on by word of mouth through training programs at medical schools. Um, we're in a different age now where my patients, you know, they can learn more about a disease process than I know about it in a matter of a couple hours at a coffee shop, uh, just kind of reading the latest yeah. articles. Um, but too much information is not all, like access information is not always a good thing. Like uh, you really need a balance with someone who has 
the expertise and the training to be able to evaluate kind of the science, the known kind of medical conditions and put it all together. And that's where having a, you know, a relationship with a doctor who gets you and has time for you, like really pays dividends. Yeah. And it's like that spoken, yeah, like, like the same language, right? It's like you have, you find your tribe, you find that community and <clears throat> I don't know, you, you'd get it. And yeah. I mean, my background, I mean, I feel like we speak the same language on multiple things, like for science for one, and then also for running. But um, <laughs> what I love about your approach to medicine is that you want to treat chronic disease with lifestyle. So and like using medication is kind of like a last resort, but more so evaluating how your lifestyle kind of impacts your health. Yeah, and like the biggest example of this, especially like with, uh, with uh, you know, middle-aged athletes is helping people with like that work-life balance, um, which is, I'm sure we'll get into later. I mean, it's almost a misnomer because I think it's kind of impossible. <laughs> but, um, you know, really looking at the stressors, whether that stressor is emotional, whether it's, you know, from, you know, work stress, whether it's from training, like stress at the end of the day is all stress and stress can manifest itself um, as a, as really a symptom on every organ system in the body. Yeah. Um, and stress is, it's really a disease in itself because with if it goes unmanaged, it just snowballs out of control into real diseases like mm -hmm. severe debilitating depression, anxiety. And then from there, like, you know, it's been correlated with heart disease, stroke, yeah, everything you can think of. Yeah, I mean, another, I was talking to to a friend of mine, actually, I was reading reading some article, I forget what it was, but mentioning um, how loneliness can actually be a really big indicator um, and basically correlative to serious diseases that, you know, we have maybe scientific quantification for, like heart disease or, you know, anxiety or something like this, but really how loneliness can actually contribute to that too. It's amazing. There's a condition called uh, Tak Takasubo um, cardiomyopathy, mm. and it's also known as broken heart syndrome. So, like when I was working in the hospital, we'd see this not uncommonly, where um, you know a, a 70, 80 year old couple, um, one one of the <clears throat> one of the people would you know suffer a heart attack, and like two days later, just from the stress the the other partner would have a heart attack as well. And what's interesting about that condition is there's not really a medical explanation for it. You can take those people to the, the cath lab and you can look at their heart arteries and their heart arteries will, like there won't, there won't be the usual blockages that you see in a typical heart attack where you get a ruptured plaque. Just yeah. for whatever reason, the body just stops working. Man, that's so crazy. I mean, and like you said, from my from my background in in neuroscience and, and physiology, like, you know, we we create these scientific. Mine is like more biochemistry research. We're we're studying these disease models, like something like Alzheimer's or schizophrenia, which it, there's an actual imbalance in the ion channels in the brain, and and we would put on these like quote unquote stressors, right, into these like cell culture, but. Yeah, like how you mentioned, like stress is stress is stress. It can manifest in any way, whether it, you know, and, and people, I think now maybe we're thinking of it more as a, as a mainstream disease, but depression and, and like mood disorders, like those are, I think those can actually can be fixed too with like changes in lifestyle. For sure. That's the first place to look at. I mean, the root cause, like if you hate your job, you hate your life, like, let's talk about it. Let's see, let's, let's get you talk. Let's take, well, let's get you talking to the right people. And uh, what I really love about working with um, CTS athletes in particular is being able to provide athletes with a team of support because yeah. then they are not alone. You know, they have a coach monitoring their training, watching their training stress 
You know, you can have a doctor um, who's there when the wheels start falling off and things actually have to have have to be done. Whether it's you know getting them into the right orthopedists, you know, getting it getting in for you know blood work to treat anemias or other micronutrient deficiencies, you know, managing illness. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like in the ideal world, having, you know, nutritionists, um, you know, diet dietary support and, you know, also uh, uh, like sports psychologists when, yeah. when, when it's needed. Yeah. I mean, this is so crazy. I mean, it's like, um, but I think it can just, it sounds like maybe a lot of moving parts, but I think it can be as simple as just getting connected to the right people, right? Like having that network and that, that support system. I think that's like where you can be obviously the expert, but also like, you know, the liaison or like someone that, you know, can like put, point you in the right directions. And how have you, how has like, how have sports influenced how, have they influenced how you approach, how you approach medicine? Oh, that's a great question. And, and they have. Um, when uh, going back to my life working in the hospital, um, mm. one of my main mantras was always move it or lose it. <laughs> as we get, as we age, um, that's even more true. Like a week in the bed when you're 20 years old, like you're going to have to get back and work to get back to where you were. Mm. You know, a week in bed when you're 60 or 70 years old, like that can be catastrophic where if yeah. you don't really have the will to push through it, you might not ever get out of that bed again. I think 60 is probably push more 70, 80, but yeah. um, it's, it's all on a continuum. Mm -hmm. So um, as an athlete, um, I have, I still, I still have that same mantra where um, I'm a huge believer in active recovery. Um, mm -hmm. So if you do have an injury, like, really being careful and deliberate about returning to sport and really trying to ride that line of when it's safe to get out and return mm -hmm. um, to when it needs to be shut down is that can uh, really make or break like an athletic career, quite honestly. Like if that an extra month of shutting someone down and not being able to get that month of training to slowly ramp back up into in, into race racing uh, condition, you know, mm -hmm. for that race, that's that goal race that's, you know, four or five months out from injury can have a huge impact on a professional athlete's career. So being really mindful of like, you know what, you might not be able to run, but like, let's get you in the pool. Let's get you on the spin bike. Let's do whatever it takes to keep you moving and keep those soft tissues loose. Cause as you know, probably better than anyone else, like when things start tightening up, like it's just a battle to, get the soft tissues to release and get back to before you were injured. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I've, oh man, I know that far too well. And I'm, I mean, I equate the like move it or lose it. I love that. That's like um, one of Newton's laws of motion. <laughs> yeah. It's so, um, it's so obvious, but it, we do it all the time. Like where we tell, you know, we tell people to, you know, bed rest, like they used to be one of the treatments for back pain and say, oh yeah, bed rest for like a week. And then after a while, like the, the studies show like, you know, that was just bad advice to give people like, yeah. you gotta keep moving. Yeah. Or even like with ankle sprains, I remember that like the protocol used to be like, like rest and elevate, but now it's like, I mean, you want to be like, I mean, even after my, my ankle injury and I had surgery, um, I was still like, I needed to do passive, like range of motion, um, on that to kind of get the, get the tissue moving again. I was in the pool as soon as I was able to, um, as soon as the incision site healed, like, yeah, it's, it's all about that. And it's, it's about like, you know, having people like yourself, I've had many discussions with you about, Hey, what do you think about this? Like paper, what do you think about I mean, we had a discussion, remember, um, that got maybe quite heated, or I usually discuss quite, like, with a lot of passion, <laughs> but we were discussing about CBD and how, you know, what effects could that potentially have, but we don't have to get into that. It's okay. But um, my point of mentioning that is just that, I mean, 
it's, it's important to have someone who is able to, you know, read all this information that we're have like, you know, that's it's the information age. There's so much information, but then to be able to tease that out and say, okay, well, you know, it's not doing nothing. I think that's what you said for CBD. It's like, well, we're not, we're not sure that, that it does <laughs> all of these things, but it does something. And I think that's a refreshing perspective to have as a doctor. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think working with athletes has really, um, it's really taught me, reinforced, I should say, the importance of just listening carefully mm. and really knowing what the goals are. So, yeah. um, you know, if uh, like if there's like that, like going back to like a goal race example, like if we know like there's a goal race, like really kind of using that kind of listening to the fact that, you know, this is their goal. Like, as their team member, I'm going to do everything I can to get them to that starting line that's legal and not going to hurt them. <laughs> Let me make that clear. Um, but supporting that, and it's tough, like, especially working with um, ultra endurance athletes. Like, you know, like, Dr. Josh, do you think I sh should, you know, start this 100 mile race in two weeks? And it's like, probably not, but I know you're going to do it anyways. So let's just do everything we can to keep you safe and try to set you up for success as best we can. Yeah. That's like a big that. thing. That's a big thing that I've learned. It's not like these absolutes don't work with passionate people like, Oh yeah, don't run. Don't do this. Like, yeah, that's not a healthy relationship. It's just like doing the best you can to give people the information so they can accomplish their goals and try to stay as healthy as they can through the process. Well, speaking of, you know, these crazy people that have these, you know, they're super passionate <laughs> and they have these big goals. You're one of these people. And I, I, it's something I admire you greatly for because I mean, Thanks. you have a family, you have a, this crazy busy career, but then also you are a killer athlete as well. I mean, maybe not. I mean, like you are. So, I mean, you, you, I mean, you still, what was, you just ran Boston? No, Boston last year. You just ran CIM, I, no? I did, I did CIM and, you know, it's all like <coughs> being, being an athlete and running, it, it, running in particular, like I love how you can set a goal and chase that, like train for it and then execute on race day and like not risk your life doing it. So like back in my younger days, like in my twenties, like, you know, sitting back in like El Cap Meadow, like looking up at El Cap and being like, Oh God, that's crazy. Like, I can't believe I'm going to go do that. And then like do it, not in like the best of style, but like, you know, getting, getting it done. Yeah. Um, safely. Um, like that felt great. But I found that like with the marathon in particular, like I'm able to fit running the marathon in my current life. Like, is that like the ultimate sport for me? Like, no, it's not. But yeah. for me, like that distance and that endeavor, like in my busy life, like I figured out like working with the coach, um, you know, really focusing on quality workouts. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that I, I can, I, I can run a respectable marathon, like with, you know, a couple hours a week of training. The hard part is I know I could do better, like if I <laughs> devoted more time and that's where I don't think the balance is really fits. I mean, I think that there's, it's all about stages in life and like what your goals are. Like right mm -hmm. now I'm building a business. I'm also the uh, medical director at a nonprofit clinic right outside of Denver where we care for the uninsured, which is just amazing work. It's so rewarding. There, I'm really, I really feel like I'm able to change lives on a daily basis. And I like giving that up, like for a personal endeavor, like running is, I, I just can't do that right now. Yeah. Um, but a, a goal of mine is to always kind of stay consistent, stay moving. So when I do have that time in my life to, you know, ramp up to, you know, crush a hundred mile, a hundred mile race and really put it all, my, go all in or, you know, go all in a marathon. Like 
I want to be in a position where I can do that when the time arises. So yeah. balance, I don't know. I, I, I've, I think people spend too much time worrying about balance. It's really about, you know, picking a couple things and doing your best and like being there for your family, being there for your friends, you know, doing like checking the boxes to, and being a responsible person and then making sure that you still have time for yourself and your own well-being. And that's what running has taught me. It's like given me like that hour and a half this morning to like spend some time running the local trails to just relax, not worry about work, not worry about all the notifications that are always going off. So then I can be better at all my other, at all my other things. Yeah. I love that. So you, hmm, so you would say there is no balance. So what, what is your best advice for someone who is trying to balance a career with, you know, athletic goals and family and all this, this stuff? I think you have to pick like maybe a, a top three things. And, and I view life, I'm not an absolute person. Like I think that things are always moving and you have to be very perceptive to that in your life. Like if it's a time to really hunker down at work, like you probably like your athletic goals should probably, should probably not be number one. Like, cause there's a time that when you can, you know, work really hard at your job professionally and then dial it back and harvest all that hard work while you have more time to really, you know, focus on an athletic goal or, you know, other personal goals with, with your family. So I think you can have balance by kind of dialing it back and forth through a couple of things. But mm -hmm. when people just have a lot on their plate, I think it's a recipe for unneeded stress and can really impact people's health and well-being. If you're so razor focused on an unrealistic goal that you aren't set up for success for, mm -hmm. um, you're going to hurt yourself. You're not going to be happy with the results. And at the end of the day, you, you probably aren't going to feel great about it. Yeah. Burning the candles at both ends. Yeah. I do that. <laughs> I know, Hillary, you have to give yourself more credit. I've really seen you. Um, I've, I've, I've really had an opportunity, like, like with social media, it's amazing. Like, <laughs> and especially as a doctor, like where this is very debatable, like following your patients on social media. Like if I was at a medical school right now, like they'd be like, Oh, like doc, Dr. Josh, like, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I beg to differ. Like when I'm following my patients on social media, I'm seeing their true selves. Like yeah. there's you no, know, I'm seeing my athletes post their runs to Strava. I'm seeing my athletes, um, you know, post, you know, when they're, you know, lifting weights, like, I can really, I get a good sense of like where people are mentally and physically from their social media, as weird as that sounds, <laughs> but it's kind of the truth. And I've seen you do a great job of like going from times when you had some really big challenges and working through those and not burning the candle at both ends. Cause you've gotten to the point in your career where you've realized um, that like going too hard is is not good for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you it's, agree? <laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree. Huh. Well, thank you. That makes you feel better. <laughs> but it is, it's crazy. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe some would argue that it's a conflict of interest, but I don't because, um, yeah, like people that I coach, like I follow them on social media too. And it's, you can kind of get a, cause it's like, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I think those interpersonal relationships, whether you're coaching someone or whether you're someone's doctor, it's more about just, you know, okay, like do this workout to get the most fit for this race. It's more about how you, you know, see them as a person, how they're doing on a whole for like, to making sure they're in a good place mentally to, you know, to attach, like attack these goals. Like an athlete that I'm working with, he's dealing with an injury. And, you know, like a lot of our conversations when we touch base, it's not about the training plan. Like, yeah, that's there, but it's more about like mentally how, how he's doing, how is he, is he handling this? Like, yeah. it's okay to take a step back and, 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 you know, have this period of time, not be focused on training, like your body. Well, Hillary, what you did like in your social media, I mean, 
Yeah. You really brought to the world that it's okay to have an off season. Like you need an off season where you, yeah. you know, don't need to wake up and crush it every morning. Like yeah. our bodies need, like I'm a huge fan of uh, the book Peak Performance by uh, by Magnus and Stolberg. And in that book, they they present this uh, growth equation that growth equals stress plus rest and the the only way to grow is to have stress, but it needs to be balanced with rest. And if you aren't getting that, then if you're just stressing yourself, you're going to, you're going to wither away and die. Yeah. Like whether that's, you know, training stress, life stress, you know, not sleeping, not eating, mm -hmm. but it's the stress that does make us stronger as long as we're recovering from it. Yeah. And that's what I love about that equation. Cause I it love just that. Lays it out. I'm going to have to pick up that book. I haven't read it. It's worthwhile. That and also uh, um, The Passion Paradox is another Ooh. one. Of, which, uh, both of those books like sit near and dear to my heart. I really like The Passion Paradox. I think one of the best things that like when I was reading this, to just like fall in love with the process of, yeah. you know, of like of training and, and what that what that looks like and whether or not it means, um, you know, like your best performance or not, like the failures are as much a part of the process as the successes. I, and that's like what drives passionate people, I think. Yeah. But then the other part of it, like, as we're both passionate people is passion isn't necessarily a good thing either. Like no. there's, there's a dark side of passion and like all through history, like passion was tied to religion and had a lot of negative connotations. So it's really about harnessing that passion to do good and be happy and mm -hmm. like somewhat content with yourself. Cause the hard part is when you don't live up to your own expectations. And as an athlete, that's the hardest thing. So like, yeah. you know, setting realistic expectations. So at the end of the day, like you feel good about the work that you put in you feel good about the process and, you know, getting back to what you, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the last marathon, the last marathon that I did, CIM. Um, yeah. You know, when I signed up for it, like six months uh, before the race, I was like, you know what, I'm going to PR this race. Like, I want to go under. I want to. I want to go like, you know, under 245. I know that I can do it. And like three months out, I was like, you know what, like, I don't have this in me right now. I just have too much going on with work, and I, I just wasn't psyched on it. So instead, yeah. like, I put in like. I, I put in like mediocre training and I, I had a, a I, I had a good result, but it, it was it my potential. No, but I had a great time with it. Like I, yeah. I'm glad that I trained for it. I had a, a great race, got to run it with, with a, with a, a friend of mine. Um, we went Which under were three videoing, hours. Like live Instagramming the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was amazing. I was getting messages from my coach, like put the phone away. I was like, no, like this is fun. I'm enjoying this. Um, I mean, there's still always like those demons at the end, like oh, like maybe I shouldn't have live it, Instagrammed it, and I should have like gone a little bit harder. But you know, that wasn't the point. Like that wasn't what it was about that day. Like it was, you know, I don't think I was in shape to you know run much faster than I did. Like maybe I could have gone. A, couple minutes faster or something but at the end yeah. of the day like you, you got to love the life that you live and you have to be good with your choices and you can't be too hard on yourself like that's something that I see all too often in my practice is just patients who are just hard on themselves and it, it gets into this point where it's like you know like I, I have diabetes and I'm not following like a diabetic diet at all. I'm like binging on sugar. I'm not taking my medicine and I'm depressed. And it's like, you know what? Like, yes, like you're not being a good patient and you're making me look like a horrible doctor. <laughs> like, let's, let's get over that. Like, let's, yeah. let's have you like, just kind of embrace like the decisions that you made and realize like we all have, we all make decisions and I'm, I don't try to be prescriptive. Like I just give people the information. It's like, you can continue to make these bad decisions and you know, the consequences are X, Y, and Z, but those are your decisions to make. And that's a beautiful thing about life is we can all make bad decisions, Yeah. but you should at least feel good about them. Own your bad decisions and be like, you know what? I wanted to eat 
you know, I wanted to drink that bottle of Coke and not take my medicine and have donuts. And it's like, well, okay, like, but, you know, if you develop, you know, end stage renal disease and need dialysis, like, you just have to be okay with that. And, <laughs> and here's the information and I'm documenting that we have this conversation and that's how it goes. But yeah, I, I, I've, I really like it when my patients make me look like a good doctor. Like that is a goal of mine. <laughs> oh, no, that, I mean, obviously that, that is goal number one, but no, like you said, it's like, that's, that's the kind of the point of everything is like, you have, you're not defined by your mistakes. And then also it's not like, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm dealing with like a, a, a person I'm coaching and they're like not following whatever directions or, you know, they're overtraining or not doing enough. It's like, yeah, okay, well, you've got to, you know, then own it in your decision when either you drop out of the race or you're not as well prepared as, as you thought you should be, or you don't reach your goal. Um, but it's also just like, yeah, that conversation of being like open and honest and yeah, it's, it's the beautiful thing about life and it's the beautiful, it's, <laughs> I don't know. I think it, it's also how we are constantly humbled by life too. <laughs> yeah, we are. And like getting to the coaching example, I was always guilty of this of just as athlete, <laughs> like always going too hard. Like that's, <laughs> that's something that I do also try to help my patients with who, who are runners where it's like, like, why am I getting slower? It's because, because you're like, racing all the time and you're like <laughs> pushing all the time like it, the body doesn't work like that it, it, isn't it fascinating that people just don't get it like no matter how many times you go around and it's like just yeah. go down and like smell the roses and you know you don't have to do a 5k every day like you don't have to be on this streak and it's like what yeah. do you mean i don't have to be on this streak it's like my goal it's like well is it actually adding things to your life because I'm not sure that it is and it's like yeah. well it's my my streak and it's like that's great I get <laughs> it but like I don't know like what are you trying to get out of it like having yeah. these hard conversations and yeah. uh, I think that's something where you know we do have similar conversations with other humans about this which are they're fascinating yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah it's like the process that everyone goes through and um so I've got a question for you um, as we're wrapping up, I have a few, a few more to end with, but just to get a sense, um, of who we're dealing with, Dr. Josh, can you tell me, um, one of your favorite adventure stories? Cause I think you've gotten into a lot of trouble, um, <laughs> in the mountains. Um, not, it might be into trouble, but I, I mean, I remember one when you were dealing with this, like you, you were saying to me how, like, you're trying to encourage me. This is actually when I broke my ankle and you were, you know, telling me these stories about like when you had certain injuries and like maybe an example of not, of what not to do, but also of just like how, like, you know, it's, you will get through it. And I mean, this is a particular one in like in Breckenridge and skiing, something like this, but. Oh God, I don't like that one. I, I did. <laughs> okay, we don't have so to go the, that the lesson, one. The lesson with that one is uh, speed can be your enemy, uh, even though it's so fun. Yeah. So I love to ski. I've been skiing my whole life. Um, it's definitely one of my main passions. Really, any kind of skiing, like probably the more dangerous, the more I like it. Unfortunately, but. The story that Hillary was talking about, I, did, I had a pretty, the worst injury of my life, um, skiing powder at Breckenridge like five years ago. And it was, it was a, it was a great day until it wasn't. I was just skiing waist deep powder and then skied into a bunch of buried rocks and just tomahawk forward and broke my neck. And it, it was hard, but really with every, with, with every injury, I think there's stuff that you can learn. And with that, I was in a, I fortunately I was able to avoid a, a, a neck fusion surgery. Uh, I was a really good patient. I was in a, I was in a, a neck brace for like six months and wasn't really doing so much, but you know, looking back at it, would I not want that injury under my belt? And the answer is no, like that, that injury, we all learn from these challenging parts of our lives. So you know, with that, you know, I learned really to be humble and, and grateful for our health because it can all change in just an instant. You can be having a great day skiing powder to like not even able to move in just a blink of an eye. Yeah. Um, 
And I also learned that, you know, there's other things um, to keep you busy. So really got into reading, um, got into, I found a love in remote control cars. I was building remote control cars and like racing them at a track. Uh, that was really fun. Got into video games. Um, I haven't really done any of those since I recovered from the injury, but you know, it wasn't bad. Um, another, probably another big kind of, the, probably the biggest epic adventure I ever had was on my first big wall climb in Zion National Park, uh, climbing a route called um, Space Shot. And uh, I was climbing with a, with a friend of mine and um, really kind of underestimated kind of the effort. Mm. And um, the amazing thing about Space Shot is uh, it's an overhanging wall and it's really committing because once you get a couple pitches up, you can't you can't repel back down because oh. it's so steep that when you repel, you're just dangling out in space. Probably hence the name Space Shot. So um, yikes! We were climbing in like a group of I think four people, which was just a bad idea, bad plan. <laughs> and uh, I finished the pitch that was like really committing, where we couldn't retreat. Yeah find out that the other two people who had all the supplies, all our water, all of our food, all of our like warm clothes, like decided to turn around. Oh no. So um, my partner at the time, a much stronger climber than I was, was like, oh, no big deal. We'll just top it out and finish it in a day. So I was like, well, I guess that's the plan. That's what we're doing. Um, we ended up not finishing it in a day. We ended up like, being totally exhausted, dehydrated, hungry, um, cold, like 150 feet from the top of the, the rim um, on this little uh, ledge called Earth Orbit Ledge. Oh and it, uh, at the time, we thought it was a great idea to like rest for like a little bit to um, kind of get the strength to finish the climb. But as soon as we stopped, we got so cold and stiff that like there was no way that we were gonna get moving again. So we uh, hunkered down for the night. We like put the ropes over us and just cuddled and were really, really cold. And the worst part of that is like our van and our friends, like they could see us like just oh down God. like whatever, 2000 feet below us from the road. But here we were like really like orbiting the earth like on this ledge and um i asked myself a really like I, i've i've never been so cold in my life and fortunately like we made it through the night the next morning like it was it was in march in uh in zion so it was like kind of like drizzling rain sleet on us but the next morning fortunately the sun came out and i kid you not like i'll never forget and this was like over 20 years ago now I'll never forget the feeling of that first sunbeam kind of hitting me because it was like, you know what, I'm alive and I feel the heat from that one sunbeam. And we got up and we finished the climb and we made it down, but it could have very easily gone the other way. So like big lessons when you're on the mountains, like don't get separated from your gear, like have like better plans, have friends that don't bail, really trust your team. Um, you know, carry good communication. I mean, nowadays with like satellite communication, like it's really irresponsible to like go out in the big mountains without a way to to call for help and let people know that you're okay. Yeah. So a question that I always get as a doctor is like, what, what do you have in your first aid kit? It's like, yeah, satellite communication or like a cell phone. Cause like when things go wrong in the mountains, like, Sure, it's like nice to have a Band-Aid, but like, get out of there. <laughs> Make sure people know where you are. <laughs> Apply oh God, pressure and get help. <laughs> yes. I love that. That's good. <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. And like those big adventures. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I and mean, I think it's part of like the grandeur of it that's like, that appeals to us, but it's also just makes you feel so small and appreciate the small things. Like that's what I love about, even like when the seasons change, like running in the cold and oh. then you just like, then you get home and like yeah. you sometimes you just have the screaming barfies in your feet and in your hands, but then like you want it to stop, but then you endure. And then 
like at the end of it, like you get to have like that warm cup of coffee. And it's just that like those well, little- Well, what it is, things. Hillary, it's like that feeling that you're alive. It's like yeah. that discomfort. And so much of our society is like trying to isolate us from the discomforts of being human, but really like embracing them, like embracing that, you know what? Like if you push too hard or you do this, like and you get hurt, like that's that line that we're choosing to run on. Like, yeah. And it's exciting, it, it, it can be healthy, um, mm -hmm. but it can also be very unhealthy. Like mm -hmm. going back to like adventure sports, like there's no doubt in my mind that they're addictive. Like yeah. they're, it's a drug, you know, you, it, it, it's going back to like the neurochemistry behind it. Like yeah. you just get used to, like once you, once your brain is used to like one dose of all those happy chemicals and endorphins, like the next time it's just looking for an even bigger hit of it. So yeah. just keeping that in mind, like I think there is balance there, like looking at amazing athletes like Alex Honnold, other, uh, other people who are in that space, like it goes back to that dark side of passion that the greats are they don't lose sight of it like you can't lose the fear you can't lose the respect for for you know going for a mountain run where you aren't going prepared especially like in the alps like mm -hmm. the alps are no joke like i've had some amazing ski adventures like skiing skiing uh the glaciers in the peaks of the chamonix region but you know, I appreciate that if I were to like spend any significant amount of time there, especially when I was younger, I probably wouldn't be here doing that podcast with you. Just, yeah. it's a dangerous game. Um, and there it is important to have that balance and to never lose the respect. Yeah. Well, I'm super <laughs> glad you're my doctor because we can talk about all of these, all of these things. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, through, through my setbacks and injuries, I've learned an immense amount about myself, but also about like, yeah, just what balance looks like for me. And I think, yeah, we've had many good conversations about this and hopefully, I mean, either, I mean, it's different for everyone, but you know, it's, it's, it's important just to have someone that you can talk to about that. And I think my final question for you today um, is just to kind of wrap up things with with Steady MD. Like I think it's it's been a feature that I mean I've I've used whether you know I'm racing internationally and I'm constantly on the move and it doesn't have to be with racing. But um, if someone has a busy job and they're traveling all the time and something pops up, it's like it's wonderful to be able to have access to a doctor. Yeah. Um, so can, how can people get set up with SteadyMD or? Yeah, thanks you know. for asking. So I'm a, about uh, two and a half years into this. And really what we offer is a personal doctor on, online mm -hmm. who's aligned with your life and has time for you. So um, you can uh, check out our website. It's www.steadymd.com. And we have a matching quiz, which is really, really neat. Because it, what it does, it just takes a couple minutes but really what it does is it matches patients with doctors who have similar interests. And mm. there's really no other service in the world that I know is, is doing anything like this. And, um, you know, um, you get matched with the doctor. Then from there you have an initial visit, which is uh, done via video call. And then from there we have a, a HIPAA secure uh, messaging app to kind of mm -hmm. keep the conversations going and we're able to order um, medications, labs, imaging, and then really be that team member for athletes. So when there is something that comes up that does need to be seen in person, we get them um, in to see the right local specialists. Yeah. I'm just like, I remember the, the moment that I broke my ankle, you were the first person that I called and you, I mean, not only obviously your friend, Dr. Josh, duh, the nickname, but um, yeah, you got me right in to see, to see the specialist that I needed to, you know, got my ankle all fixed right up. So yeah, that, was, that was not a good day. But no. Again, like all these injuries and we're all human. And when you're pushing the line in sports with life, like having a doctor on your team to make sure that you're doing it in a healthy way is what we're all about. 
Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank, thanks for having me. And hopefully um, we'll be able to share some trail miles in the near future or some skiing so. or other adventures. <laughs>